from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by Marshall University, with more than 100 degree programs offered in four locations and online. More about the Marshall family at marshall.edu. Welcome from the Capitol Building in Charleston. I'm Suzanne Higgins and this is the Legislature Today. We'll have an update on news and activity here later in the program, but first we welcome Senate President Mitch Carmichael. Senator, thank you so much for being here today. It's always a pleasure to be with you, Suzanne. Thank you. Now, you rolled out the Senate Republican legislative agenda today. It's all about jobs. It is about jobs and it should be about jobs. Uh, the people of the West Virginia deserve opportunities that are found throughout the rest of America. And we've been on an incline path with regard to more jobs, better wages, more opportunity for our state. But uh, I think it's very important that the legislature, particularly the Senate, keeps focus on creating more jobs, more opportunity, and more, frankly, hope for the citizens of West Virginia. It feels good to be a part of this resurgence of our state. It's a focus on, um, on getting that uh, labor force participation rate yeah. up from last in yeah. the nation. It, you've hit on the uh, probably the most important marker of our economic uh, status in West Virginia. Many people may not be aware that we have the lowest workforce participation rate in America. In other words, the people that are eligible to work in our state do so at about a 52 or 53 percent rate, whereas that's, that's the last in the nation. And we believe it has a lot to do with obviously our opioid epidemic, but also the lack of skills, the training uh, that doesn't match the workforce needs. So we were very intent last year to introduce and pass Senate Bill 1, which uh, was a, you know, a bill that I championed that uh, enabled community and technical college education for every West Virginia. And, and less than a year into yeah. its implementation, there it, it has made an impact. It has made such an incredible impact in just just since June 30th of this year, there have been over 3,000 West Virginia citizens that have applied for and received community and technical college training and additional uh, certifications and degrees. They're in these programs, they're learning, they're gaining these skill sets that will allow them to get into the workforce. And the beauty of it, a lot of people might not be aware that we required uh, the applicants to apply for all the federal aid and over 1,700 people didn't require a dime's worth of uh, West Virginia money. It That's was all federal. It is yeah. incredibly significant. And just think about the lives of the people that are being changed by gaining uh, a skill set in welding, electrical, plumbing, nursing. Many of these skill sets that are so vitally needed in our state, we're training the workforce and it's really going to make a difference. There's a, a, a really disturbing statistic of almost 60,000 people that have left uh, this state in the in the last five years, and I know that uh, your your caucus have said a lot of the things that you're trying to to do will will hopefully address that. You talked about workforce expansion, the expansion of Senate Bill One this year. Broadband expansion is is on the table. That's going to be very difficult. It's very expensive. I mean, how how do we go about broad broadband expansion? Well, it's a great question, and I, this is an area that I have uh, private sector experience mm -hmm. in also. And a couple of the proposals that are really uh, innovative is uh, the power companies, First Energy, AEP, are, have a proposal to provide fiber optic middle mile technology within the electrical grid. Uh, and so doing that provides uh, uh, access to many of these third-party providers that they can then de deliver last mile connectivity to our homes and many of our businesses throughout the rural and urban areas of West Virginia. It's really an innovative approach. We're very anxious to take a hard look at this and to see how we can uh, provide a better incredible access to broadband technology in West Virginia. It really is the currency of the 21st century. You cannot conduct commerce without world-class broadband service. 
Also on your platform, eliminating the personal property tax on equipment and machinery. You know, I've heard from uh, Democrats as, as well as Republicans that this needs to be removed, but the big question is, you know, it's a hundred million dollars that goes back into our counties, our county school systems. How do you ensure that that won't come up short if you eliminate this, this tax revenue? It's a great question and first let me take it in two parts because the first part is to build the case for eliminating it and realize how much it's costing us having that tax in place. Suzette, governors from both parties, clear back to Underwood, Wise, Manchin, every governor. And, and, and let me just say that you do have to build the case because yes. this will take a constitutional it amendment will. and a supermajority to, yes. to remove this. You're, so you've got to get the voters to I, say yes. I, we have to uh, make sure that everyone in West Virginia understands that this tax that's been identified by governors from both parties, renowned economists throughout America, has been identified as the number one job-killing tax in this state. And we all know that manufacturing jobs are the jobs that we need. They pay average salaries, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars that you can support a family and they have all these spin-off jobs. And what's so important to realize, uh, any manufacturing entity that wants to locate in West Virginia can go right across the river to any of our contiguous states and not pay this tax. So if you're a business in, uh, in a manufacturing concern that can locate anywhere in the world, why would you come to West Virginia when you have to pay this tax every year, personal property tax every year? So how will we make that <clears throat> up? So I think the case has been made for why we need to eliminate it. It will create jobs and opportunity. Now, how do you make up the revenue, the $100 million uh, that currently goes to the county school systems and the county to run the county operations? And what our idea is, what our proposal is, is to step this down over a period of time and allow the natural growth of our economy to absorb the cost of that uh, reduction in the tax, such that perhaps we put in a four or a five year phase out that we're taking $20 million a year and allowing the growth of the system to backfill that those needs. That's Further, pretty optimistic. It's not as optimistic as one thinks because our general growth in our budget is well over $100 million per year. So on, if you look back over the last eight, nine, ten years of our, on an uh, average incline, we're growing at $100 million a year. We can absorb this. Furthermore, the elimination of this tax or the phase out of it will create more jobs and opportunity. And so we want to make sure that the counties and the uh, school boards are made whole that they receive all the money that they're currently receiving. But we also want these jobs, manufacturing jobs and the spinoff uh, jobs that are created by this new opportunities. For our radio listeners and mm -hmm. those who are listening to us on our streaming service, we are speaking with West Virginia Senate President Mitch Carmichael. Um, Senator, the, the governor's proposal very, very quickly, uh, the, the, of course, both chambers are taking that up. It's conservative. There are not a lot of new initiatives. Any red, red flags do you have about anything in there, anything that you're going to have to dig a little bit deeper in order to throw your, your support behind? Well, I commend the governor for proposing a very conservative budget that uh, doesn't uh, wildly increase spending. He has uh, set aside within the Medicaid line item $150 million uh, in a trust fund, so to speak. And we we'll want to take a harder look at uh, the manner in which that's being accomplished. But I commend the governor for uh, the uh, additional funding for these IDD waiver programs for the children that were in, in, in the adults, frankly, that are in those situations where they have disabilities uh, to provide them some additional relief. And then the additional money that we spend on children and families is so important to me. Uh, it's, in fact, I want to talk about that at some point in this interview, is that the state Senate has uh, comprised a new committee solely devoted to children and families because we're aware very acutely of the 7,000 children that are in foster care systems. Uh, and the opioid epidemic has hit very hard in that area. And uh, we want to take care of our children and provide those kids that have been dealt perhaps a bad hand in life because of uh, various circumstances and scenarios, we want to provide them world-class services that enable them to climb from that, uh, uh, those current circumstances to be the absolute best they can be. So very excited about that program. 
And in a related issue with our children, of course, is, is, is public education. And I wanted to continue. You talked, uh, you talked a little bit about higher ed education assistance with Senate Bill 1. Um, when it comes to uh, our leaders of public education, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's no secret that you haven't been very pleased in the last six months. We had the state superintendent of schools uh, in the House uh, Education Committee earlier today. Um, just two months ago, Senator, you said in an opinion piece, quote, there's been a litany of excuse making from the state education officials yeah. following the release of the National Assessment for Education Progress, results which show West Virginia test scores falling behind again, mm -hmm. unquote. And then even earlier in the summer when the state board offered a pay raise to the state superintendent of schools, you wrote, quote, I believe this is symptomatic of the board's consistent pattern of mistakes and misalignment with the steps that are necessary to enhance student success. So tonight, what is your evaluation of our public education leaders? Well, um, let me just say I'm very proud to have written these comments, I, and I would reiterate them today. Uh, and our leaders from the state education department have uh, received a wake-up call, I believe. They've looked at what the legislature has been able to accomplish, and uh, when one is confronted, Suzette, when the people of West Virginia are aware of the performance of our testing results, our testing results, how else should one evaluate an education system. I mean, I hear all the time from the education department these uh, excuses about a, you know, uh, one thing after another. But at the end of the day, it's about educating kids. And we care, this state's in it, and me personally, and the legislature care about our children learning and being able to compete on a world-class level. So very uh, intent on making sure that we provide that those services and when you look at what we've done in education, under our leadership, teacher pay rates have gone exponentially higher. The, I mean, for years under Democrat control, there were no pay raises, zero. A, a little bit, $1,000 here, $1,000 there. Under the last two years, we've given the largest pay raise. And they've earned it, they deserve it, the teachers. But in state history, the largest two pay raises in state history have been uh, delivered under the last two years. Furthermore, we've put additional $30 million into additional wraparound services in our schools for school counselors, nurses, healthcare professionals, those vital services that are needed. So this legislature and the people of West Virginia are making enormous financial commitments to the to the education, public education system in our state. And we, the citizens and our parents and our students deserve results and we're gonna keep the pressure on. Uh, the state superintendent of schools today, again in the House Education Committee, asked for time for all of these reforms to be put in place. He's, he talked about a wave of reform in 2015, 2016, and of course last year, 2019. At the same time, we heard your Senate Education Chairwoman say that uh, you know more reforms are ahead for this session. Well, no, I, I believe that uh, Dr. Payne is correct in that we need to allow the changes that we've brought to fruition to, uh, to, to take root uh, and, and see if there are results. I think you know a complete upheaval year after year is not the right approach. And our Senate Education Chairman does a great, amazing job. And I uh, believe her comments were more intended at the higher education level and ensuring that we uh, continue the, uh, to, to focus on children or student achievement, but also support our uh, teachers in every way that we can from a financial and a wraparound services perspective. So she's on the page of allowing these um, uh, changes that we've made over the last several years to to take hold within the system and provide stability. All right, and also we well we just have a couple minutes. I was mm -hmm. going to ask you about uh, the secondary roads bill that Senator Smith uh, mm -hmm. spoke to today. Uh, I know that's part of your priority list as well. Yeah, when one looks at the priorities that we have in the state Senate, uh, it's jobs, 
roads and transportation and addressing the opioid e epidemic and then making sure that while we're doing all that, we keep our focus on our children and our foster care uh, system. So uh, the roads and transportation network is primarily centered, the issues that we're having is funding. So we need, and we've done everything humanly possible to provide the funding that is required to bring our transportation system into the 21st century and correct these problems that have been allowed to, to fester for years and years and years and years. We're on the job fixing it. And then uh, uh, the personnel issues within the Department of Highways, they've had some arbitrary statutes that prevent them from getting new employees in the door quickly and efficiently. So. Uh, those are the issues that we're working with transportation. Senator Carmichael, West Virginia Senate President, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's my pleasure. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Lawmakers this year have formed the West Virginia Prayer Caucus. Randy Yowie reports on the new lobbying group made up of legislators themselves who say they pray for divine intervention in shaping faith-based initiatives. What will we be praying for? We, God in his holy Bible has given us the standards of how society and families and governments and individuals are to live and govern themselves. Gathered in the Senate rotunda, the group's introductory press conference included Bible passage quotes and politically pointed prayer. But Lord, this is a, a group that says we're gonna go a little bit above and beyond for bills that reflect your glory. Led by Republican Senator Mark Maynard and Republican Delegate Tom Fast, several Mountain State lawmakers have now joined national faith-based legislation forces in forming the West Virginia Legislative Prayer Caucus. Every day of this session, members will gather before the gavel goes down to plan and then pray over those plans. But legislative prayer is nothing new under the Capitol Dome. House of Delegates Clerk Steve Harrison takes pride in displaying a prayer session picture with President George Bush. Going back decades as a former delegate and senator, Harrison would shepherd legislators in prayer breakfasts and Bible studies. Throughout the history of our state, uh, the legislature has been opened in prayer, and uh, my guess is there's probably been several informal Bible studies going on at different times. This can be a very contentious place, and that's a time of, you know, we can get together for lunch and kind of share each other's burdens, uh, do a study and, and pray for each other, and I think, it, I think it helps the environment. But while many of Clerk Harrison's prayer and Bible activities were informal, this new group will ask God to help guide specific agendas. Denigrate society when you go away from faith-based initiatives. Talk about legislation that's coming down the pike, whether it's a good thing to support or maybe something we need to oppose. These West Virginia legislators now join the American Prayer Caucus Network to promote both state and nationwide, and I quote, a culture of strategy to promote prayer, protect religious freedoms, and ensure enduring legislative solutions are in place to preserve America's Judeo-Christian heritage. The fact of, of prayer not being allowed before football games, we're going to look at stuff uh, like that, and Ten Commandments being allowed in government buildings and prayer at schools. As policy director for the West Virginia ACLU, Eli Baumwell fully supports the Prayer Caucus's First Amendment rights to associate, but is, quote, staunchly opposed to all the mentioned entanglements, large or small. We would oppose all of those things. Um, prayer in school in particular, that's been litigated before. We know students have the right to pray in school. It can't be led by school officials. Um, the Ten Commandments is just one of many religious beliefs out there. Um, courthouses, which are what's supposed to be a put in the law, should not be promoting that particular religious belief. I don't need a caucus to pray. Democratic Senator John Unger will not join the prayer caucus. An integral part of informal legislative Bible studies for years, the ordained Christian minister says to the caucus's end that scriptures speak of praying in public and the motivations involved. One has to be very careful about that uh, because it does say in Matthew that, uh, uh, that if you pray out in public uh, that you'll get your rewards here in public and not up in heaven. Senator Mike Azinger closed the press conference with a prayer. Help us to love our neighbors as ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. But does the senator's loving your neighbor prayer fly in the face of a 2019 op-ed piece he wrote opposing the Fairness Act? The lawmaker said that members of the LGBTQ community live a perverted and non-biblical view of sexuality. 
Senator Asinger answered that it's comparing apples and oranges. Our neighbor is, is everybody. We're supposed to love everybody. But, but loving our neighbor doesn't necessarily, we're going to agree with the lifestyle that we think is, is unbiblical. Prayer Caucus member Delegate Danielle Walker proudly supports the legal rights of all people. Walker says there needs to be separation of church and state and prays for love of all, not oppression, and she will fight from within. That introducing policies where we exclude people and we deny people human rights, that that would change in them. Walker says she was disgusted when she learned this legislative prayer caucus would carry a political agenda. It shook me to my core to have people contact me and say, Danny, why were you there? Why would I not want to show that we are one? The West Virginia Legislative Prayer Caucus heads bowed to look forward, but in what direction? I'm Randy Yoey for the Legislature Today. Join me now, senior reporter Dave Mistich. Dave, so good to have you back. Yep, another year, another, <laughs> another, another year. legislative session. Let's talk a little bit more about the Republican priorities that were articulated today. Sure, and, and as we just heard from Senate President Mitch Carmichael, it's all about jobs, tackling the opioid crisis. Um, the one thing, and I, I'm gonna sound redundant here because he talked about it earlier, uh, but this idea of the repealing the, uh, the manufacturing uh, business inventory personal property tax. A lot of words there. We've heard up to uh, $100 million in revenue. They've talked about a phase out. Uh, and just to reiterate this point, it would, re would require two thirds majority in both the House and Senate, as well as the vote of West Virginians on the ballot come presumably November if it were to pass the legislature. So, um, and we're gonna throw really quickly just to a clip of Senator Carmichael earlier today. Uh, this is him uh, at a press conference outlining that outlining their uh, the Republican agenda in the Senate. The jobs, roads and transportation, and fighting the drug epidemic in our state. Those are the big focus items that we'll be uh, putting our energy and our efforts around as we uh, tackle this legislative session. And underneath the category of jobs, we're looking to finally do away with a manufacturing uh, tax on personal property inventory and equipment. Another bill that uh, the Senate rolled out, actually even before the, it, they gaveled in, um, Senator Carmichael uh, was side by side with the Attorney General, sure. uh, rolling out what is now Senate Bill 284. And that is Republican legislation to protect pre-existing conditions should the Affordable Care Act be struck down. Right. And of course, that's been received with a lot of criticism, a lot of cynicism. Democrats today having a press conference uh, saying that it was a hypocritical face saver in an election year because it wouldn't be needed uh, were it not for this years long attempt and perhaps successful by Republicans across the country to disable the ACA, commonly known that's, Obamacare. That's right, Obamacare, Obamacare, yeah, that's right. And uh, should point out that Attorney General Patrick Morrissey has signed on to that litigation um, that's still pending. Um, of course, pre-existing conditions protect, uh, are a part of the ACA, uh, and this bill would, would sort of cover up that part if should the ACA be repealed. So. All right, on a, on a lighter note, I'm gonna say it's a lighter note, we were talking about our friends in Frederick County, Virginia today. That's right, uh, uh, Senate, uh, Senator uh, Charles Trump of Morgan County uh, introduced uh, Senate Concurrent Resolution 2. Um, basically, the, this whole, uh, this piece of legislation uh, invites Frederick County, Virginia to join West Virginia. Um, I should say that uh, it was adopted on a voice vote over there in the Senate. Um, officials in Frederick County, Virginia didn't answer uh, questions that I had about whether or not they want to come join us, but I did see the, where uh, a newspaper in that area, actually in Maryland, uh, quoted someone from that a county official from uh, Frederick County that said that they're not interested in becoming a part of West Virginia. I spoke to uh, Senator Trump about the motivation for this piece, uh, for this resolution, and here's what he had to say. The main motivation was to actually a couple to bring people's attention to the history which uh, which I think is fascinating I, I didn't know but in Wheeling in 1862 it was clearly contemplated that hey Frederick County might 
be one, should be perhaps, one of the counties that form the new state of West Virginia. That uh, plus uh, just our common affinity, affection for the people and institutions of, of Frederick County, Virginia. And Dave, it's an important day in West Virginia if you're running for office this year. That's right. The, uh, the filing period opened up today. Just going to give you a quick rundown of those who, uh, who put their name in the hat for the 2020 election cycle. Uh, on the presidential ticket, the only one to come in so far is Democrat Pete Buttigieg, of course, former mayor of South Bend, Indiana. Uh, in the race for U.S. Senate, Democrats uh, Richard Ojeda, he's a former state senator, had a very short-lived run for the president of the United States in this election cycle, uh, is running for U.S. Senate. Uh, as well as Paula Jean Swearingen, another Democrat. They're going to square off in a primary to try to unseat Shelley Moore Capito, the Republican who's the current incumbent. Uh, the race for governor, Woody Thrasher, the former Commerce Secretary in the Justice Administration, and former delegate uh, Michael Folk, uh, also running for governor, uh, making his candidacy official today. A whole dozens and dozens more for House of Delegates, State Senate, State Supreme Court. Uh, of course, they've got up until Saturday at midnight to get that filing in and We'll be paying attention to see who runs. All right. Thanks so much. Dave missed it. Thank Appreciate you. it. Tomorrow on the Legislature Today, Speaker of the House Roger Hanshaw will join us. Also a focus on hunger in West Virginia and the growing needs of state food banks. We hope you'll join us. I'm Suzanne Higgins for everyone here at West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Have a great evening.